Black Vineyard. Vin Keller sat in a slightly reclined position at the table. A man of considerable size, his bulky frame just about dwarfed the chair he was sitting in. He stared at the interesting necklace of assorted jewels and animals' teeth, which draped around the neck of his host. Mr. Noka, the village minister, sat directly across from him. Vin was soaking in subconsciously the dark and foreboding details of the room. The table, from what Vin could imagine, was probably crafted sometime in the 1800s. It was riddled with elaborate carvings and swirled etchings that simply weren't seen in these present times. A smoky, burgundy, tinted glass oil lantern sat in the center of a tattered cloth placemat. Its flame was the room's only light source. It swayed and leaned from left to right as it sent its light through the reddish-colored glass, showering all four walls with its somber glow. A house servant requested permission to enter the dimly lit room in his native African tongue. Come in, Hakima, the host commanded. The servant entered the room holding a tarnished silver tray with two shot glasses and an aged bottle of high-priced liquor set upon it. Vin also noticed that the tray was probably a costly antique with swirled etchings of a master smith. Thank you, Hakima. If I need you again, I'll call. The servant nodded and then turned to leave the room. How long have you been in the village of Black Vineyard? Mr. Noka inquired. Vin leaned forward to take the shot glass of bourbon that Mr. Noka had just poured for him. He rubbed his forehead as he answered. Well, Noka, about eight months. Then you must know the reason as to why I've summoned you. Well, anytime anyone ever calls upon me is because they're in need of my big game hunting skills. I can only assume that you're in need of them as well. Very good, Mr. Keller, said Noka. It is in a dire urgency that I plead for your prowess as a skilled hunter. My village has come under attack. There was a brief silence. Whatever it is is unknown, and even if you were to combine all the assaults of the jungle, cats, wolves, reptilian predators, it would still not measure up to the ferociousness of whatever it is that is now plaguing my people. I see, replied Vin Keller. What is it? I'm without an answer, Mr. Keller. Of course, anyone who's ever encountered it has died a violent death. Mr. Noka took the bottle to pour himself another shot as he grasped for a way to describe the horrible dilemma that faced his people. The terror began, I would have to say, a little over seven months ago when two of the most tactful, talented hunters in the village began to discover the dismembered remains of animals. Vin listened intently as he swallowed another shot. Sadly, a lot of the remains they found were of animals that richly fed our community. The hunters began to set traps in various locations in the surrounding jungle in an attempt to capture whatever or whoever it was responsible for this waste, but turned up nothing. Nothing? No. Instead, the findings became much more grisly. Mr. Noka paused and looked at Vin with eyes that were desperate. Vin gazed back into Mr. Noka's eyes and his own mind froze and became deafened by the searing screams for help that appeared to echo from the look of Noka. Mr. Keller. Believe me when I say that no price you can give me can be too great, nor can my gratitude and appreciation for your agreement to help us, should you decide to help us, of course. I understand, Vin said. Well, say now, you say the findings became more grisly? Mr. Noka looked away and his gaze rested upon a shelf of musty books and tribal trinkets. He stared at wooden bookend statuettes at each end of the shelf as they were barely lit by the lantern's illumination. The statuettes' likenesses were of snarling baboon or orangutan type creatures, and it was apparent that the sculptor of whom chiseled them into creation paid extreme attention to detail of these pieces, right down to the many facial wrinkles and razor-like teeth. Shortly after the hunters discovered all the mutilated animals, Noka continued, 
three of our village women were found by the river partially devoured. Vin's eyebrows rose slightly at this bit of information. They were washing clothing and had gone as three for the sake of safety. After a day they didn't return and a search party was sent to find them. My wife was among the three. Vin sat quietly before tipping the bottom of the shot glass upward once more. He downed the liquor and set the shot glass on the table. He wiped his mouth with the heel of his hand. He leaned back in his chair and his gaze never strayed from Mr. Noka. There was a long pause. Mr. Noka, I'll, I'll do everything that I can to help you and I, I'm sorry for your loss. Mr. Noka's head dropped and for a minute it appeared to resemble a tennis ball dangling from a string. As he continued to hang his head, he began to speak. Mr. Keller. Then raised his hand in protest like a traffic cop. Don't give it a second thought, Mr. Noka. I'm actually happy to help. There's a few things I'm going to need from you to be able to do this. Mr. Noka slowly rose his head upward to gaze at Vin. Anything you need, just let me know and I'll make sure that you have it. I'm going to need two of your toughest guys. I mean, two of your baddest motor scooters to assist me with the hunt. And the other thing is probably not a concern to you, but I require a trophy. Because it's customary for me to take any and all possession of a kill for my personal collection. Mr. Keller, that is fine with me. In fact, it's... I wouldn't be happier to know that whatever this thing is no longer has any form of a presence near my village ever again. So take what you want. The moon's gonna be full tomorrow, Mr. Noka. So we'll head out then. Tomorrow evening. We'll need its light. Okay. I'll have my servant escort you to your quarters. Ven nodded lethargically as he struggled to get up out of his chair. Both men rose to their feet. Mr. Noka opened the door to the room to beckon his servant. Akima, show Mr. Keller to his room. The servant was prompt and nodded as he led Ven down the narrow corridor, which was laden on both sides with colorful masks and assorted weapons that are common of the tribe. As the servant and the big game hunter rounded out of sight, Mr. Noka once again lowered his head and uttered a prayer. He felt a papery pulse in his ears. The next day was heavy with planning and the coming night's agenda. Mr. Noka took notice that Ven's arsenal wasn't of the stereotypical big game hunter. For instance, a single shot 22 rifle, which didn't really line up with his reputation of such an accomplished big game hunter. Seemed odd. Next was a bow. He kept the arrows tightly tied together in a quiver made of some animal's skin. Having succeeded in rounding up only one tough motor scooter, as Ven put it, Mr. Noka offered his own services to assist in the hunt. Mr. Keller, I can only acquire one hunter, as the others have since fled the village in the wake of this horror, so I will go with you as well. Ven looked up sardonically to Mr. Noka as he loaded bullets into a bullet belt from an aged wooden box. And Mr. Noka was dressed in a warrior's vesture, which displayed his chiseled features as well as many scars upon his body that were possibly acquired in tribal battles. He gripped a weathered spear which rested upon his shoulder. The two warriors stood side by side as Ven surveyed them both. They continued to gather gear. A few hours later, they had dinner which consisted of roasted boar and fried bananas. Once finished, Ven walked outside to view the blood-red moon which was already casting its glow behind the trees of the nearby jungle. The final red rays of the lingering sunlight were dwindling into twilight. Insects had already started to encircle the torches that had been lit outside. As Ven stood quiet, he could hear the faint sound of jungle nightlife. He listened as, in the distance, its sounds created a cacophony echoing throughout the walls of the many trees. He took a cigarette from a box in his breast pocket and lit it, continuing to listen as the noises became more defined. And as he took his first drag, the noise stopped. Everything silenced. Aside from a few crickets, 
which were clearly at the jungle's entrance. There were no sounds heard within at all. He exhaled the smoke that filled his lungs as he listened to the deafening silence. A minute passed as he had been waiting for some sort of noise to resume, but what met his ears at the next moment would cause him to wonder. What sounded like the cackle of an 80-year-old woman mingled with the searing high-pitched squeal of a porpoise was heard. Jungle wildlife, Ven thought. Plenty of it out here, that's for sure. Mr. Noka was now stepping out onto the deck and was met with the same sound that Ven was listening to. Sure are some noisy creatures out here, huh, Noka? That, to my friend, is the sound of death, Noka said. There has always been a legend about this jungle since time immemorial, Mr. Keller. The legend is that deep within the jungles of Black Vineyard, the dead never rest. It is a frightening ting when the sun goes down, but more like a madman's dream in the light of day. But lately, dream is reality. Mr. Noka's gaze seemed to pierce the very jungle itself, looking a thousand miles past the jungle and into nothing at all. Vin then snapped his fingers only inches from Mr. Noka's face. Let's get our things together so that we can start out. Mr. Noka, starting, nodded his head. Shortly after, the three men began a trek through ant-infested palmetto brush and rain-moistened greenery. Ven glanced around, soaking in even minute details of the surrounding jungle. Vines embraced nearly every tree within the jungle, resembling veins and arteries in a biology textbook. As they advanced further toward the innards of the jungle, the atmosphere grew sinister and dark, more threatening. The bad motor scooter, Hunter, that Mr. Noka recruited stayed at the rear of the party, caressing a necklace charm, and uttered silent prayers as he gazed around, eyes wide. Mr. Noka was also on point as he gripped his spear with both hands, surveying every nook of the jungle as he awaited the unexpected. After trudging forward for a while longer, the night was full blown. The moon was now high above them and shined its bluish glow through the several jungle trees. The persistent sounds of the nocturnal creatures added to the eerie ambience of the surrounding area. Mr. Noka observed Vin's relaxed attitude with weapons not ready or drawn, but only briefly gave it a thought. But after a while, he began to get slightly concerned, awaiting a sneak attack from an unknown predator or something of that nature, wondering if Vin would be ready to defend himself in the wake of the onslaught. The jungle was shrouded in complete darkness now, as an ankle-high mist slowly crept along the forest floor. With a feeling of intense nervousness now, Mr. Noka felt the need to exercise slight levity to alleviate the heaviness of his fear. Mr. Keller, I noticed that your weapons are not drawn. You don't seem to be worried too much about being attacked. I understand that you are an experienced game hunter, but still, shouldn't you be prepared? Is the thrill of the hunt, Mr. Keller? Mr. Noka seemed a bit perplexed by this random response. Thrill of the hunt? Yes, Mr. Keller replied. Moments passed as they continued to charge forward into the darkness of the jungle. Mr. Keller still leading the way, still no weapons drawn or ready, and the bad motor scooter in the back still trembling as he prayed, holding on to the necklace charm. This time, Mr. Noka seemed to feel something click in the back of his throat as an idea entered his mind seemed to be slowly working things out, you know? As he fixed his gaze upon Ven's back, thoughts began to roll through his mind like a broken movie projector. Thrill of the hunt. Big game hunter. Thrill of the hunt. Personal collection. Trophy. And at this moment, he felt a squeak exit his throat. Then he spoke to Mr. Keller, or began to speak. Before he could even utter two words, Vin, the big game hunter, the reputed champion known countries apart, slowly turned to face the hunters, both of them. The scene had now taken the most horrifying turn as Vin stood progressively shaking uncontrollably, 
His once vital face had now begun to take on an unearthly form as his mouth twisted upward into a ghastly death's head rictus. His eyes shined yellow with no iris or pupils and were set in wide sockets, and large, beige-colored teeth with oversized canines appeared from behind his full lips. Long streams of clear saliva dangled from his curved mouth and vibrated like the strings of a cello. As his convulsions grew more severe, a voice rattled in his throat as the startling transformation occurred. His appearance taking on the form of some sort of a simian creature. Remember our agreement, Noka. His voice low and grumbling sounded similar to an outboard motor being shut off. I take any and all possession of a kill for my personal collection. The screams echoed throughout the jungle and then silence. Well, I guess you could say that Mr. Keller was up to some monkey business in the utmost form. <laughs> Sorry. Sleepy Hollow, the Unknown Victim. Folklore and legends have tantalized the American psyche since the earliest settlers arrived from Europe. Tales of the macabre and twisted especially grip our dark imagination and throttle our deepest fears. One tale in particular has stood out as the pillar of horror, the legend of Sleepy Hollow. It is from this legend that an unknown story will now be revealed. The fall of 1790 was much colder than remembered by many of the chattering citizens of Terrytown, New York, who were hard-pressed to carry forth. Jacob Voss sat alone in his dark room above the stables. As the dreary evening gave way to an abysmal night, the hectic bustle of the outside world slowly subsided. Jacob turned a teary yet angry face toward the stove, rekindling the dying flames. When just a bit of welcome warmth fought back the frigid cold, he returned to his musings. How could she reject him? What was it that forced her hand into the hand of another? He could not grasp it. Being a young man of 21 with wit, charm, and ambition, he was dumbfounded at her dismissal. As his mind ran wild with unnerving ideas, his resolve was steadfast. Leaping to his feet, he gathered what few belongings he would need for his journey to recover what he thought was rightfully his, her heart. Bursting through the shaky barn doors, he startled the old keeper and farrier who was covering the horse's stable. Is he ready? I mean to depart. The old man looked troubled and said, Now? At this hour? On a night like this? Jacob snarled. That's what I said. I'm riding north to Sleepy Hollow. With a deep look of shock, the man ominously whispered, But sir, the legend. Mounting his horse in haste and looking back, Jacob growled, To hell with the legend and the price of your stable. Yah! He yelled, and with the sharp jab of his heels to the steed's hind quarters, he stormed off into the waiting jaws of blackness. Traveling post haste with his mind as foggy as the blur of wilderness streaking past, he suddenly realized he was nearly at his destination. Slowing to a slight gait, the thick woods seemed to have changed during his brash ride, or else the fury in his mind blinded him to his surroundings. The eerie foliage crept and undulated beneath the perverse shadows cast by the full moon as thick and ominous clouds drifted endlessly across the sky. Through a breakage in the swirling mist, he saw the vague silhouette of a covered bridge that marked the way into the hollow. Continuing forward, now with a slight knot in his stomach and the old man's last words echoing through his mind, But sir... 
the legend. He crossed the bridge slowly, coming to a halt after clearing the structure. Suddenly there came a rush of wind that unseated him and his horse reared back and ran horror struck into the misty hollow. After gathering his wits, Jacob stood up, dusted himself off, and stared around the village before him. Some cottages had windows slightly aglow. However, the wistful sound of a lone fiddle drifted unperturbed from another. It was from this home that two men appeared and shook hands. One man turned and walked away. He was a tall, gnarly fellow with an odd stride. The man at the door spoke. Mr. Crane, do take care. I fear the woods are ripe with evil this night. The man addressed as Mr. Crane looked back and nodded his thanks, and without another glance back, he seeped into the inky darkness. As young Jacob's eyes followed the man out of sight, two things happened at once. First, the woods around him suddenly went silent. No frog or cricket or any other nightly creature could be heard. Almost as if a demonic force had squeezed their throats into abject silence. And then, to his astonishment, the brain of a horse from behind him, from the road he had just traveled. Jacob turned and looked beyond the darkened covered bridge to a new silhouette, that of which his old farrier had described before. A horseman, cloaked in black and wielding his crafted Hessian sword. One chilled and ragged breath, one step backwards, was all it took to finalize his fear, as the echoing hooves ran dark throughout the town as they thundered over the enveloped bridge. Turning to run, heart pumping a great tattoo upon his chest, all reason lost, Jacob heard the sterile swish of the perfect bush as his world turned round and round like a crazed carnival ride. As if a veil had been lifted, he gazed forth upon his final sight, that of his very own headless body, lying to his left, no blood oozed, no movement save that of the horseman who had turned slowly, purposefully making his way towards his new trophy, and with regret, remorse, and foolhardiness, Jacob was swept beneath the waves of complete and utter darkness.